Hello and welcome to seminar number six in this COVID-19 seminar series, co-hosted by the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization and the Deakin Science and Society Network. My name is Tao Fan and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute and I'll be chairing today's discussion with Professor Ian Eng from Western Sydney University. I'd like to open this session by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm standing, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledge the Indigenous traditional owners of all the place that you're listening from. In a week that's been marked by protests internationally to yet another murder of a Black person by the police, I think this kind of acknowledgement of country serves as a good reminder for us to examine our nation's own record on violence against Black and racialized bodies and to consider how we can direct our energy towards racial justice here as well as overseas. Now, if you're joining us live, please do feel free to feel free to introduce yourself on the YouTube chat. As with the other seminars in this series, we'll be running the Q&A component using the chat function. So if you have any questions for discussion, please post them in the chat and my colleague Emma Koval, who is moderating today, will pass them on to us. You can also ask questions via Twitter using the hashtag SSN seminar. And don't, and don't forget to add us at Deacon SSN. Or if you prefer to email your questions through, you can send them to ssn-info at deacon.edu.au. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Ian Ang is Distinguished Professor of Cultural Studies at the Institute for Culture and Society, Western Sydney, of which she was the director until the end of 2014. She's internationally recognised for her wide-ranging work, focusing on the formation of audiences and publics, the politics of identity and difference, migration, nation and multiculturalism, and Australia-Asia relations in a global context. Her latest books are the co-authored Chinatown Unbound, Trans-Asian Urbanism in the Age of China, and the co-edited Cultural Diplomacy, Beyond the National Interest. Welcome in. Thank you, Tao. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you to you and to Emma Kowal for inviting me uh, to present uh, today's talk. Uh, first of all, I'd like also to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land where I'm uh, speaking from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, and they are the cust uh, traditional custodians of the place uh, we now call Sydney, which is where I'm speaking from. And I'd like to pay my respects to all First Peoples, elders, past, present and emerging. And my second uh, point before I begin is to say that what I am presenting today is not based on really long-term substantive uh, research, uh, which many earlier presenters in this seminar series have done. Instead, what I'm hoping to provide is a reflection of my furious reading and thinking in the past few weeks and months while being in lockdown reflecting on the implications of the crisis we are going through today and what it says about the world we live in. So crisis talk is pervasive today. Uh, 2020 has begun with the bushfire crisis and now of course we are living through the COVID-19 crisis. While we are all caught up in the immediacy of the, these crises, let me first discuss what kind of reality is evoked when we talk about crisis, right? So a crisis tends to be constructed as an extraordinary event that disrupts a normal routine state of affairs. One dictionary definition describes a crisis as an event that is, uh, or is, expect, is expected to lead to an unstable and dangerous situation affecting an individual, group, community, or whole society. So crises are generally deemed to be negative changes in human affairs, especially when they occur abruptly with little or no warning. More loosely, the term uh, means something like an emergency event that requires immediate exceptional action so that it goes away. Now, there are three problems with this narrow definition of crisis as an abrupt, temporary, and negative upheaval of normal affairs caused by a singular emergency. First, this emphasis on the suddenness of a crisis is problematic in relation to both the bushfire crisis and the current pandemic. 
Many have sufficiently pointed out that the bushfires of this past summer could have been anticipated, not just because of the drought, but more importantly, because of the impacts of human-induced climate change. In this regard, the bushfires were not a sudden extraordinary crisis, but, but a symptom of a longer term, more slow burn crisis, what is now often called the climate crisis. The COVID-19 crisis too should not be seen as a sudden event, given that scientists have warned for years that a pandemic of this nature was not a question of if, but when. They suggest that viruses that have caused SARS, MERS and COVID-19 are just the vanguard of thousands of potential pathogens in animal reservoirs and the risk of uh, new outbreaks in future is increasing as a consequence of human intrusions into wild animal habitats, for example, through massive deforestation and a, an expansion of farmland to feed more and more humans, as well as human infrastructures such, such as globe-spanning transport networks and densely populated mega cities. So in this regard, the COVID-19 crisis too can be seen as part of a longer term planetary crisis, a crisis which some have signified with the concept Anthropocene. It is not just a crisis of the changing climate, but a broader ecological crisis caused by the way in which human societies are encroaching into the life worlds of animal populations. Disease ecologist Peter Daszak suggests that we now live in a pandemic era in which humans may have to adjust to a new reality where new viral outbreaks are a regular part of life, just as we will be forced to adjust to a much warmer climate in the decades to come. And this brings me to the second problem of a narrow definition of crisis, which is that it is a temporary disruption of life as we know it. But as many commentators have observed, the post-pandemic world will in all likelihood not be the same as it used to be. Yeah? We won't just snap, snap back to business as usual. How things would turn out to be is uncertain, but it is historically the case that times of upheaval often generate radical change. For example, the Great Depression and the Second World War set the stage for the modern welfare state in Europe and the decolonization of much of Asia. But of course, change in response to crises can also have a much darker quality. For example, the U US's war on terror in response to September 11 led to a decade long uh, destructive uh, war in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and the global financial crisis in 2008 led to the massive proper, propping up of banks and financial institutions and austerity politics in the broader society at great public cost. So one of the things we need to focus on is what qualitative changes might emerge as a result of the current crisis and what kind of new normal societies around the world might strive towards. The third problem with a narrow definition of crisis then is the assumption that crises always involve a negative change in human affairs. Now, of course, the loss of lives and livelihoods because of the pandemic is tragic and disastrous and thus uh, definitely a negative event. But taking a step back, we could also see this crisis as a wake up call, throwing light on what is wrong with the way the world has been operating and providing glimpses on a better alternative future. For example, it would be interesting to see what the experience of cleaner air, absence of traffic jams and massive decline in CO2 emissions might generate in terms of people's consciousness of the limitations of the way we live and how they might shape political desires of drastic social change. So rather than seeing this pandemic as just a transitory public health crisis then, I'd like to see it as a symptom of a much broader and deeper organic crisis. And I'm using here Antonio Gramsci's term. 
that permeates all levels of society, including economic structures, political institutions, social arrangements, long-standing ideologies, and cultural values. Now for Gramsci, such an organic crisis has to be understood not as a singular event, but, a, but as a much more protracted process, a multidimensional transformative process of unraveling that originates in intrinsic contradictions and tensions in the prevailing social order. An organic crisis like this cannot be resolved only by medical, scientific, or technological solutions because it points to a deeper societal impasse, one that requires more fundamental effort to navigate it. This impasse has already been quite clear in the intractable challenges or so-called wicked problems that have accumulated in the past few decades, including worsening social inequality, institutional and political stagnation, chronic lack of investment in public infrastructures, and the degeneration of actually existing democratic systems into cynical marketing exercises dominated by short-term self-interest and greed. Add to this a wide range of persistent socio-cultural problems, such as rising obesity and youth suicide rates in a world of material plenty, and many more deeply contradictory issues, such as low birth rates coupled with deep hostility towards immigrants and runaway technological invention dissociated from social needs and uses. So how should we respond to this broad ranging societal malaise? Now it is common to suggest that underpinning this multi-dimensional organic crisis is the supremacy of the predatory system of global neoliberal capitalism, which has gradually come to dominate the world in the past 40 years or so. Put simply, this is a system that ruthlessly prioritizes ceaseless economic growth, profit maximization, and private interests at the ex expense of the public good and collective human well being. Contestations around the search for a vaccine against the virus provide a good example. Vaccine production in the current global system is in the hands of just a handful of big pharma companies. But these companies have for years been reluctant to invest in vaccine R&D because it is so expensive and risky and so difficult to make it profitable. In recent months and weeks, as the world is desperate uh, uh, for a vaccine to tame the coronavirus, many governments, pharma companies, and research teams have risen to the challenge of finding a vaccine. At the same time, there has been calls for a free COVID-19 vaccine for all. Yeah. So here is uh, what we have here is uh, a call for, to, to see a vaccine as a public uh, good, as a global public good that must be distributed equitably and free of charge to the whole world based on the pooling of intellectual property. And this is of course an idea that has equality and solidarity at its core. A resolution to this effect was campaigned for by many NGOs and world leaders in Europe, Asia and the developing world and adopted at a World Health Assembly a few weeks ago. It is telling to note, however, that pushback was initially expressed by the United States, arguably the most fat, unfettered neoliberal capitalist society in the world, on the argument that stripping the pharma industry of their patent rights would cut into their profits and discourage develop development of new products. So what is being promulgated here is the neoliberal idea that profit maximization is the quintessential motive for the pursuit of knowledge and innovation, trumping any regard for the common human interest. So the pandemic has exposed how dysfunctional the prevailing economic system is, based as it is on the principles of monetary gain and market competition, where what is most needed are cooperation and collective solutions. 
Indeed, neoliberal capitalism also stands in the way of effective climate action as the predominance of short-term economic thinking advances the vested corporate interests of the fossil fuel industry, making the slow emergency of climate change even more difficult to tackle. Some theorists have suggested that the contradictions of neoliberal capitalism are increasingly destructive of life worlds erupting into the organic crisis of contemporary societies as we are living through now. In fact, there have been very powerful critiques of systemic failures, um, systemic failures of this system. Uh, for, these are some examples. In this context, it was interesting to note how the neoliberal proposition that there is no such thing as a society, of uh, Margaret Thatcher's infamous phrase, has now been explicitly discarded by Boris Johnson's pronouncement that there is a society after all. And some commentators have expressed the hope that the current pandemic crisis might finally challenge the fundamentals on which the contemporary modern world is built and open up new avenues for a more humane future for all, for all you know, a future beyond capitalism based on social justice, solidarity, and shared humanity, living in harmony with nature and the planet. The question, however, is how do we get to this wonderful new, almost utopian world? What is at issue here is the question of transition, right? A period of intense transformation towards a new, more desirable post-capitalist world. But if it is indeed the case that the organic crisis we are in is leading us into such a transition, we should not expect it to be an easy one. A very bleak image of what we can expect on our road to a post-capitalist future is provided by the German political economist Wolfgang Strick in his book, How Will Capitalism End? And he said, before capitalism will go to hell, it will for the foreseeable future hang in limbo, dead or about to die from an overdose of itself, but still very much around as nobody will have the power to move its decaying body out of the way. Now this reminds us of this warning Gramsci made about organic crises. He said, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot yet be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. In other words, we need to recognize that the temporality of this transition or this interregnum, as Gramsci put it, is going to be a long drawn out one, which may last decades or even longer. And this would be a period of morbid symptoms in which no real new system or order will emerge. Instead, it is likely to be a period of extended instability and uncertainty one in which constant crisis management may be the name of the game. So rather than focusing on what the all new future might look like, our priority should perhaps be to understand how we can live through this difficult transitional world. That is, we should focus on the complexities of our present. Right? So that's what I'm trying to do uh, here. Our present condition is, of course, far too complex to provide a comprehensive analysis at this, in this seminar. So I will only refer to a few morbid symptoms that pose unprecedented challenges to our world right now. And in doing this, I will be keeping in mind Gramsci's uh, other famous dictum, namely optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. And I will focus on three dimensions of the contemporary organic crisis, namely the rise of the extreme right, the specter of a new Cold War, and of course, the ecological catastrophe. First of all, I'd like to point to the complex and contradictory role of human passions, affects, and emotion in political uh, society. 
It is disturbing to see that precisely when we need global solidarity more than ever, we can see a cacophony of discordant self-interested fractions with little vision of a common future in sight. In the current pandemic crisis, I'm thinking here of the widespread fury against physical distancing and self-isolation measures as people prefer to claim their personal liberty over a regard for the health of, of the community. An expression of the selfish, possessive hyper-individualism so strongly promoted by the culture of neoliberalism. This trend is complexly linked to the huge upsurge of the far right in the US and Europe in the past decade, associated with the rise of nationalist populisms in so many places. These movements, mobilized by impassioned anger and resentment, whipped up by a fear of loss of their white privilege, lashing out against a range of others, including migrants and minorities, minorities but also against what they see as elites, right? Which I presume would include intellectual communities such as uh, what we are engaging in right now. How do we deal with such reactionary movements who are after all also part of our common humanity? Can we ever heal such passionately held divides? Or should we understand this deeply divisive friction as part and parcel of the very organic crisis we are living through today, this long protracted interregnum towards an uncertain future. In any case, I do think that we need to confront the real and scary prospect of a resurgence of fascism in the years to come. On a more global scale, I am particularly concerned about the impact of the very damaging an escalating new Cold War between China and the West, and of course, particularly to the United States, but also Australia. The blame game against China as the origin of the pandemic was bolstered by anti-China attitudes that have already been spiraling upwards in the past few years. It is of course hugely important that we critique China's authoritarian regime when required, and we definitely seeing it, for example, in relation to what has been happening in Hong Kong uh, last week. But it's, it is important to stress that this anti-China attitude is not just a rational uh, matter of protecting our national interest, as politicians tell us, but is nourished by a deeper and more persistent xenophobia, which ra has run through Western societies for centuries, exemplified by the enduring trope of the yellow peril. Visceral disgust of the so-called wet markets today echoes the prejudice association of disease of, uh, with Chinese spaces, bodies, and culture, which were prevalent more than 100 years ago during the plague outbreaks in cities such as Vancouver, San Francisco, and Honolulu, which resulted in the burning down or quarantining of whole Chinatowns. Then as now, racist xenophobia against Chinese migrants was easily whipped up. And of course, we've seen that again during this pandemic. The difference between then and now, however, or this is, is okay, is that China is no longer the degenerate sick man of Asia it was once dismissed to be but an emerging global superpower. This is why anti-Chinese racism today is not the same for, as for example, anti-Muslim or anti-black racism, which we have seen uh, uh, very distressing scenes in the US, of course, in the last few days. In, in the case of uh, anti-black racism, uh, the racialized other is devalued as worthless inferior by contrast, I suggest that anti-Chinese racism is motivated by a much more ambivalent anxiety. It entails not just a cultural aversion and distrust, but also a sense of awe of Chinese power and astonishing rise. In this light, I would argue 
that racism against Chinese and against Asians who are mistaken for being Chinese is more like anti-Semitism, where Chinese people, like Jews, are simultaneously maligned and admired, charged with both superior qualities and with despicable inhuman traits. Now, this resonates strongly with the uh, Fu Manchu uh, character, which was very popular in the 20th century in uh, popular fiction, uh, including in Hollywood. You, you can see some examples of that. China's sheer size and ancient culture, often visualized as a threatening dragon, reinforces a sense of dread for what the future might bring. Its current geopolitical and economic ascendancy threatens the hegemony of the West and the liberal world order, which is another dimension of the organic crisis we are experiencing right now. Talk is now rife about an economic decoupling of the US and China in a bid to undo the connectivity that has been established in decades of globalization, which in fact, has been so lu powerfully lucrative for the global capitalist class. The danger of such a confrontational stance, however, is that it might hasten the so-called decline of the West, a self-fulfilling prophecy where China might have won. So, um, and here on the right-hand side is, is a, a cover of uh, a book by uh, Kishore Mabani, one of the few non-Western uh, observers about the China-US um, uh, rivalry. None of this is certain, of course. Uh, that is to say, none, not, uh, we really don't know what the uh, conclusion of, of this uh, West-China rivalry might, might be. But in a socio-cultural sense, we are already seeing the corrosive effect of this heightened uh, conflict, uh, cold conflict, in terms of a more general mutual mistrust. A recent survey showed a huge rise in, uh, in both the US and China of, of uh, people not wanting to buy products from the other country. So more and more Americans now say they will shun buying products made in China and vice versa. Now this is ominous as such emotionally invested cultural nationalism, uh, which really is being whipped up by political leaders, not just in the US and China, but also here in Australia, will be difficult to keep in check and raises the specter of a racially tinged real and imagined clash of civilizations in which the world is no longer perceived as one shared by a single humanity, but as separate geopolitical and ethnocultural uh, spheres locked into mutual suspicion and hostility. Such a split world would be especially dystopian for all those who would be crushed in between. Uh, and that would be the case really for the millions of people of diasporic Chinese and Asian backgrounds who have settled in the West in the past century, including more than 1 million here in Australia who are people of uh, Chinese ancestry, who risk being ostracized, as we have already seen in terms of the rise of racism against Chinese that I have referred to earlier. But the loss of a sense of common humanity is also especially dangerous in light of perhaps the most existential dimension of our contemporary predicament, climate change and the ecological crisis. Much Western environmental discourse tends to speak for or on behalf of an abstract humankind, a culturally and racially undifferentiated we, which I suspect often uh, is assumed implicitly to be a Western predominantly white we. But it is obvious that this planetary crisis cannot be addressed without China, which after all, is the home of one sixth of the world's po population. Nor for that matter, can we leave out the rest of the world outside the privileged Euro-American center, which includes Australasia. We know that addressing climate change is only possible 
if we have global cooperation and solidarity. This means that we need to work against the pervasive uh, absolute, absolute dichotomies of self and others, uh, of self and other at various societal levels that make it so hard for different sections of humanity to see uh, things and do things in common, right? In other words, what we need here uh, is a truly inclusive universal, universalizing cosmopolitanism, one that maintains a radical openness to the other. And, and this is really nothing new, but uh, I think it's a much more important and urgent uh, vision to have right now. But this too is not as simple as it seems. For a serious inclusion of what some people call the global South in our conversations about climate change uh, requires us to engage deeply with the real materiality of the, the desire for modernization in the post-colonial developing world even today. And I'm referring here to the work of uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti. A key example is air conditioning an everyday cooling technology that is taken for granted in wealthy countries, but the acquisition of which is still a popular aspiration amongst the millions of ordinary people in India and elsewhere in poorer countries, especially now that the world is getting warmer, right? So there is an obvious irony here, as Chakrabarti observes, the very technology that can help to protect people from climate change also accelerates the rate of climate change. For Chakrabarti, this dilemma posits the difficulty of being modern. And it confronts us with the limits of any human-centered notions of politics. As he puts it, we knew that humans were also a biological species, homo sapiens, but the knowledge was of no special political import. But when the planet faces for the first time in its entire history, the bleak prospect of a great extinction driven by, one, uh, by the activities of one biological species, us, the urgency of creating a sense of politics based on this second understanding of ourselves as a species dawns on us, but we don't know yet how to do that. We could say that this is where we are at in our present condition. We don't know. We really do not know how we as a species should respond to the escalating crisis, not just ecological, but also economic, ideological, and cultural. Crises that intersect and converge to threaten to wipe us all out. Indeed, this very lack of knowledge is part and parcel of the current organic crisis, a crisis where the old is slowly but surely dying, but where the new cannot yet be born. What we are made to be made aware of, however, is that cosmopolitanism is not enough if it remains solely focused on the unity of humanity. As difficult but important as it is to nurture and maintain a vision of one world and a single humankind against the myriad divisions and exclusions that ravage world society, as I have briefly sketched here, cosmopolitanism must also reach beyond its own human horizon to address not just the global, but the planetary challenge facing us. In other words, we must also reckon with the fact that as the dominant colonizer of the planet, we are responsible for its impending destruction and the possible extinction, not only of ourselves, but also of the many other species living on earth. This requires a cosmopolitan openness that includes a critique of its own human biases. So where does this leave us? I realize that I have told a very gloomy story here, but in order not to put us all in a deep depre depression, I should not stop here. 
So after the pessimism of the intellect, what about the optimism of the will? Of course, I don't have any grand solutions in the face of the vast challenges ahead of us. In fact, some authors are so convinced that there is no future for human civilization as we know it, that they urge us to prepare for collapse instead. This is the perspective, for example, of the collapsology movement, which has been growing in the past decade or so, especially in France, and who seriously set anticipates the collapse of to happen within a few decades. And this uh, is originally a French book that is, I think, about to be coming out as an English translation. I would argue, however, that we should resist such apocalyptic certainty. Instead, I think we should emphasize uncertainty. Not knowing what is going to happen next is, in this regard, a positive not a negative thing, because it keeps things open and thus subject to action. It means that in this interregnum of transitional ambiguity, we need to engage with the full complexity and difficulty of the present, what Donna Haraway has called staying with the trouble. Haraway does not have a lot of time for those who revel in the inevitability of collapse, who say that the game is over, it's too late, there's no sense of trying to make anything better. Instead, she proposes that we attempt to stay with the trouble, by which she means that we face the situation head on and work together on more modest possibilities of partial recuperation. In the recognition, she says that we require each other in an unexpected collaborations and combinations. The fallout of the COVID-19 crisis provides multiple examples of such partial recuperations. For example, we have seen some small but meaningful expressions of solidarity against anti-Asian racism and other forms of mutual recognition. We are seeing how Chinese and Western scientists are continuing to collaborate, including in research for a new vaccine, despite the, de the deteriorating geopolitical tensions between China and the US. And in relation to the environment, we see how cities are fast tracking the con conversion of roads into bike lanes to promote a safe mode of urban transport that is also ecologically sound. There, these are obviously very small, non-utopian, but positive actions that tackle problems at hand. And it is at such situated levels of practical action that our optimism of the will can make its impact. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, so we have, there's about a, a 20 second delay between um, the stream and what's happening here. So I'll just invite you to end your screen share. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'll kick us off with our first question then um, while we wait for the others to catch up. Um, so it really strikes me that these are, uh, are such profoundly complex topics that you've introduced. And I know you've written previously on, on navigating complexity um, and how we as cultural studies scholars should perhaps reorient ourselves to knowledge um, such that we can do more than just cultural critique. That is just more than naming complexity. Um, so I wonder if you had any, any thoughts on that and, and more specifically, I suppose the role of cultural studies scholars um, in doing more in this time, as many of us, I think, really are succumbing to that paralysis. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tao. Thank you for that question. Um, well, I think um, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the specific role of, of cultural studies. And, and one of the things uh, that I think cultural studies scholars can do uh, and which I have tried to do in this talk anyway, is precisely by not becoming over-specialized. So uh, that means uh, holding a lot of different 
uh, things together, things that happen in the world uh, that generally are discussed in, in kind of just one kind of type of, of scholarship, uh, but aren't, they, they don't get into conversation with each other. For example, I've been reading quite a lot about, uh, you know, international relations, uh, but also about environmental crisis. And there is actually very little work that actually brings all those things together and makes them kind of uh, converse with each other. And I think it's only through uh, such understanding of what's happening uh, across the board and the different trends and, and, and developments that, that are happening that, that we can actually start thinking the full complexity of, of, of a situation, our current situation. But at the same time, I mean, uh, th that's why I do think that, that Gramsci's notion of, of pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will is, is really actually quite an empowering one because it means that we should not uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, be afraid of, of the pessimism uh, and of, of the difficulty because we really have to, to, to kind of confront that head on in our knowledge. Uh, but at the same time, it's precisely because when we do that, then we have a better sense of what we can still do. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. And I mean, um, I'm really glad you brought up Donna Haraway and staying with the travel um, because it's, it's a, a nice it's, notion, I think, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. And it precisely asks us to yeah. sort of uh, eschew the future, the idea of the future for a moment mm. uh, while mm. we can stay with the present yeah. and the complexities of the present. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I've got a question uh, actually from Emma Cogall, uh, and she asks, I find the comparison of sinophobia and anti-Semitism really interesting. And can you talk more about the different kinds of fear of Jews and Chinese people versus the fear of other kinds of minorities, for example, black and indigenous people? And what are the consequences for anti-Asian racism uh, to shift to a different register of fear? <laughs> that's a, that's a, <laughs> I've been thinking really, <laughs> you know, I need to, to, to kind of work much more on that issue. But uh, uh, one of the things that I find quite uh, interesting in thinking about different modalities of racism is that um, white superiority uh, in relation to, you know, African Americans or against, uh, against indigenous people in this country uh it is is kind of it doesn't feel uh, um, uh being challenged right whereas uh the superiority of whiteness in relation to china or even to jews uh, especially kind of uh, uh, in the, the early 20th century was much more um uh, kind of also infused with it, with an anxiety that that actually kind of uh, these are uh, people or civilizations or culture that might actually uh, challenge our superiority, and uh, I think in relation to anti Asian uh, racism uh, we can see that uh, very much uh, for example in the notion of the model minor minority. Uh, or in the notion like that a lot of uh, uh, Chinese and Asia, uh, East Asian students are doing very well in schools, uh, maybe too, too, they are doing too well, right? Uh, and that was the kind of, of uh, uh, um, fear or anxiety that was also expressed about Jews. Um, so uh, there is that sense of, of ambivalence, that sense of, of, of uh, fear of uh, maybe being, uh, being challenged in our superiority that uh, we can see in relation to anti-Chinese and anti-Asian racism, which does uh, pose the question of, of how do we deal with that? Uh, because I think, uh, uh, in relation to, to anti-black uh, racism, it's very clear that, that there is kind of a moral kind of a dimension there that is very uh, uh, absolute, I think, uh, which we can see very much uh, with the death of, of George Floyd, for example. Whereas in the context of anti-China and uh, anti-Chinese racism, 
we also now have the problem of, of a rising China and a Chinese regime that, that in itself has so many problems that we have to confront as well. So, you know, I think it becomes really complicated then. Yeah, I really agree with that. Yeah. Um, and in particular, I suppose, we often see the language of sort of privilege directed at um, Asian. Asian. Every, yeah. every time you bring up sort of anti-Asian sentiment, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sinophobia is not real, is a, yeah. is a refrain that's often thrown around because actually sort of um, Asian people are said to be thriving. And they yeah, yeah, so you're rich anyway, or kind of you're wealthy and uh, you're making good careers. So what, what are you complaining about? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of actually really difficult when you have sort of your own language uh, thrown back against you. And so, and yeah. so it's really difficult to combat that. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from Sunita Saka, um, who has two questions. And the first is, uh, would you agree that the neo-colonial rather than post-colonial rises in the interrogum? Uh, and the second is, how should we account for the desire of the marginalised to the air conditioner? Uh, so I didn't quite get the first question. So what was it? I think it's more about um, uh, the rise of neocolonialism rather than, say, post-colonialism. Mm. Um, I'm I'm not completely certain what what uh, what you know what uh, what she means by that. But um, in relation to kind of the air conditioning. Um, it's very interesting. It, it's um, uh, actually Deepesh Chakrabarti writes very well about it, and he doesn't know the answer either. Um, it's 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 about the um, uh, modernization uh, was of course a very important dimension uh, of uh, anti-colonial nationalists na national movements in, in the twentieth century. The idea was uh, to become modern. To, to become a modern society, to embrace modernity was seen as part of the emancipation of all peoples around the world. So there was a, a bit of a universalism of modernity as, as, as the new kind of uh, global civilization. Um, and I think uh, um, we can't simply uh, um, dismiss that desire for modernity as a desire to catch up with the West, right? Because that's generally what, what is being said. Like, okay, we want to be like Western countries. So that's why we want the air conditioners as well. Uh, but uh, there is something else going on there that uh, uh, kind of has something to do with uh, the emergence of, of uh, new visions of a better life that, that that people experience on the ground. Uh, I think a lot of poor people in, in India and other places uh, uh, experience the, the, the precarity of, of their lives uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of in a, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, and kind of uh, technological solutions and, and, and solutions that come with modernity more broadly are um, you know in, in very practical senses uh, having an impact in, in improving lives uh, and that's something that we cannot dismiss right I think it's very especially in relation to, to uh, climate change uh, politics it, it's a very difficult and, and uh, uh, you know problematic and unresolvable kind of uh, dilemma that uh, we need to to to, to, to address really. Mm. Mm. So I'm not sure that that's an answer of the question. No, I mean, I think it's a good um, outline of, again, the complexity of, mm. of, of inequality yeah. um, and trying to work through the many layers that are there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how that, that desire is actually symptomatic of something else. Yeah. So, like, like you know, uh, Deepesh is saying, well, you know, kind of one of the things that we do know is that it's impossible for the whole world to have air conditioners because then we will definitely have kind of, uh, you know, the climate crisis coming to a head in a few decades. Mm. But, you know, can we, do we then say you can't have it? 
better. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's more to air conditioners than just, you know, than just comfort, you know, it is, yeah. you can't um, uh, project a certain professionalism without it. That's why all our hotels that we have conferences in have like massive air conditioning. Yeah. So I mean, like the place can still wear suits. suits. <laughs> you know, and it has become a first world uh, uh, nation in a way uh, because of air conditioning which in itself perhaps is, you know, uh, the existential uh, dilemma, really. Mm. Mm. Okay, so we have a question on uh, uh, non-humans and the environment. So how much of a challenge is it to extend theories of cosmopolitanism and coexistence to non-humans and environments? Uh, and has this been embraced by scholars? And if not, what more needs to be done? I'm not sure how how much it has been embraced. I uh, am actually only starting to think about that because uh, precisely because of the complexity and the you know the multidimensionality uh, of, of 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 our current crisis. Um, to me, cosmopolitanism in the human sense uh, remains absolutely crucial because that's the only way we can actually address things like racism, uh, you know, uh, inequality, things like that. Uh, and, and what I find uh, problematic with some environmental uh, writing is precisely that it too quickly uh, uh, assumes a, a humanity that is one uh, without looking at the differentiations within humanity that cause all these divisions. So, uh, the, so the cosmopolitanism of, 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 of that, that the idea of, of, of human solidarity remains crucial to me, but it simply is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, confronted with its limits when we have this um, climate and planetary crisis. Uh, and I would very much like people to, to kind of really talk about that that kind of uh, intersection of, of cosmopolitanism as we have known it and, and, the, and more environmental uh, planetary debates about kind of the post-human uh, future or, or the, uh, the modern human future that, that we might kind of have to embrace. Um, but it should not come only from those uh, who actually kind of for whom the, the debates about cosmopolitanism are important, like which, which are perhaps uh, people like us who who uh, have to, you know, kind of. To me, cosmopolitanism is also very strongly associated with notions of hybridity, notion of 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 uh, um, uh, mixing and 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 kind of interlocking uh, identities and things like that. Um, uh, things that that kind of uh, uh, get bracketed often by uh, people who talk about we humanity, we have to save the, the planet and things like that. So there, there is a very difficult conversation to be had about that, which I'm sure some other people have done it, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear you. I sometimes feel like when you read uh some discourse that's trying to do that sort of we're not done with the human yet though it's sort of, mm. or isn't it convenient that the category of the human comes to matter just as you know we have more people of color coming into institutions or you know um yeah you know it's sort of like just as the the train is i think donna haraway describes it as just as the train is sort of pulling up to the station or like just as you've got your ticket to step onto the train it pulls away from the station a human. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. less and less all of a sudden there's sort of things like critical race come to matter yeah Mm. Um, and I suppose in particular that um, it's you know, people commune very well with animals without communing well with their, their <laughs> yeah, their people, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that I do think also, you know, kind of sometimes I do have a bit of a scepticism about that kind of like, you know, kind of the, the way in which engagement with nature um, replaces engagement with other human beings who are different. And yeah. that's problematic, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think Jack Halberstam has spoken a little bit on this and has given a talk in particular on sort of the way that people protect their dogs and, you know, have parks for their dogs and room for their dogs and property for their dogs. But, um, you know, in places like New York, where Jack is from, where there are, where there are parks for dogs, but people aren't allowed to be in there. <laughs> right, right, right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, so we have a comment that's passed on from Fran Martin, mm -hmm. um, and this is in relation to uh, the points around anti-Asian and, and um, uh, anti-Semitic discourse. So there's also a historically embedded discourse of the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, in particular as the Jews of Asia. Um, and she says, I think it originated as a racist discourse, but speaks to some structural parallels connected with diaspora itself, especially diasporic people's historic lack of land ownership and engagement in trading as a source of wealth. Um, yes, it, yeah. absolutely. Uh, that's absolutely true. I mean, when we look at, at that comparison with Jews, I mean, there, there, there is actually a very good uh, edited collection uh, by Anthony Reid and, and uh, somebody else, um, uh, which is uh, about the comparison of, of uh, uh, Jews in Europe and uh, Chinese in Southeast Asia, um, and and there is of course uh, very much a colonial component to that as well because of the position of Chinese in Southeast Asia being very much uh, confined by colonial policies about indeed kind of uh, Chinese had to be confined in particular areas, could only do particular jobs, which were mostly trading, uh, not uh, kind of uh, engage in agriculture and things like that. Very similar um, policies really that also confined the lives of Jews in uh, 19th century uh, Europe. So uh, th there are certainly, so that th as a result of which uh, these diasporas became uh, peoples who were very strongly involved in 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 kind of trade and in, in uh, kind of uh, therefore also with finance and things like that. And um, that in itself becomes uh, quite uh, tricky because uh, they then be easily become scapegoats whenever there there is some sort of a crisis which we can see very much still like in countries like Indonesia. So for example, right now also um, in relation to the pandemic crisis, uh, well, here in Australia, we talk about anti-Asian racism, but certainly in, in, in kind of some Southeast Asian countries, it's, it's much more specific anti-Chinese racism uh, as a result of, of kind of uh, fear that the Chinese might be kind of the ones who actually have brought this about to, to, to the country. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a problematic thing. And I think also kind of um, the, um, uh, the rise of China uh, and its very strong economic uh, influence and, you know, uh, dominant uh, economic uh, influence now in countries like uh, Australia, we see that, that, that association of Chineseness and money, for example, very strongly uh, uh, coming to the fore again. Yeah, and especially even in, uh, I suppose, translating the crisis, it's like the we can't have their money anymore. Like this is the crisis for universities. It's like, oh no, yeah. <laughs> international students are stuck. We can't have their money anymore. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have a question on um, uh, the Chinese government. Uh, so the rise of the PRC is a big part of the transition to a post COVID world. Are you worried about the political power of the PRC and how can we negotiate these issues while avoiding Sinophobia? Oh, that's such a hard one. I mean, again, you know, uh, the, 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 I, I do think that that's probably uh, a good task to have, uh, but a difficult one. Um, what I have seen in Australia is attempts by uh, anti-Asian racist uh, activists to say, um, uh, we are not, we are Chinese, but not the PRC, which I think is a good one, but how kind of can you make that clear to, to you know, those who are intent on seeing China as the absolute enemy? Um, I think that, you know, 
this brings us back to discourses of diaspora and, and hybridity again, because I think um, one of the things that we need to try to, to ensure is to make sure that we don't get this absolute dichotomy of China on the one hand and uh, the West or Australia or the United States on the other. And uh, this notion that we have these entities that are kind of only going to be in confrontation. It's about taking that in-between position and making sure that that in-between position uh, makes it possible for us to ask more uh, nuanced questions about relationships and difficulties and, and ways in which we can still interrelate in ways that are kind of not going to result in mutual uh, exclusion. Uh, it's, it's, it's a positionality issue, I think. Uh, and uh, to say that, oh, we are not Chinese, we, we are not BRC uh, uh, associated, we are Chinese Australian, uh, brings out the nationalist discourse, which in itself also has its own limitations. So um, I think it's an ongoing issue. Obviously, uh, critique of the PRC uh, uh, government is absolutely crucial, but I see so much writing in the uh, Australian media right now that it's so crude in its criticism. It's, you know, uh, to yeah. cry about, really, I think. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm really glad you brought up sort of uh, the nationalist discourse that's sort of brought in when you're trying to sort of defend a certain position. It is really difficult not to easily fall back on the idea that, you know, I'm not a bad Asian, I'm one of the good I'm, I'm a, yeah, yeah, Asian. Yeah. I'm an Asian Australian, not an Asian, you know. Mm. Um, and it's sort of how can we do that without also reproducing yeah. Um, yeah. the very frameworks that, that we're yeah. for this. Yeah, so the, the point here is actually to, to somehow unsettle the very notion of national identities, of national uh, kind of uh, loyalties mm. and things like that. And mm. kind of it, it's become so dominant now as, as one of the other discourses that, that, that are being uh, brought forward to, to, to rally the troops now. So uh, I think that's, that's one of the things that we have to be careful about, not mm. wanting to be uh, going in the slipstream of that. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from uh, Takeshi Hamano from Kitakushi oh, University. <laughs> um, so they ask, uh, regarding cosmopolitanism, um, or cosmopolitan sense of hybridity, how can we intervene with the rise of the new US-China Cold War within the Australasian context? <laughs> how can we intervene? Um... Oh, it's that's um, well, just a simple, actually, just a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I really do hope that uh, well, you know, at the at the at the international relations level, um, I have been thinking very strongly that now we really need to have a very strong European Union, you know, <laughs> and the European Union uh, in itself is a, an interesting entity because it's actually uh, within its own boundaries, which of course those boundaries have to be critiqued as well, but um, within those boundaries, within the European context, there, there is a strong of sense of uh, solidarity and, and, and sharedness that, that is being promoted. Um, so kind of, uh, that, that is actually quite interesting because, it, you know, kind of, of course there is nationalism there as well, but there's also a sense of a supranational or a post-national uh, uh, sense of, of being together as, as, as Europeans in this case. Um, so that means that there is a bit of a loosening up of, of senses of identity, which is important. Now in Australia, I think it's harder because we don't have kind of that kind of like when, when we had this discourse that was very strong about Australia being part of Asia, that was actually a way in which we could open up that idea of, of what is Australia, right? It's not just 
kind of this kind of um, post-colonial uh, European outpost, but it's also part of a geographical region, which is Asia and things like that, which, you know, kind of really made it, made it possible or it, it, it enabled kind of more kind of open-ended discourses of, of and more plural discourses of, of who we are. Um, I think we still have to uh, pursue that, I think. Uh, at the moment, it seems like uh, what we are now focusing on in Australia is very much how kind of we can, you know, have this bubble with, with New Zealand. Uh, so, okay, uh, that, that's one way in which kind of uh, international solidarity can then be expressed. But uh, we should not really forget that uh, Australia remains very much part of this region, uh, which includes China uh, and where uh, kind of uh, anxiety about China's rise is, is as, if not perhaps more uh, kind of strong than in Australia. So um, discussions will continue to have to be had about uh, Australia's way in which it can be con 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 continue to be part of the of the, the broader region, including all the difficulties that the region actually has. Mm. So, just a, I mean, just a quick follow up on the idea of um, uh, the European Union and that move to sort of post nationalism. There is such a pushback, though, um, and we see that in the in the growing alt right and conservatism. That's true. That's true. But but at the same time, I mean, I'm I'm following EU politics uh, a little bit on 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 in you know kind of in different magazines and things like that. And and I think luckily there seems to be a bit more movement now, kind of especially after in in, in this pandemic crisis that there is a more more a sense of like you know um, that northern European societies will have to be showing more solidarity with, with the south uh, of, of Europe, uh, Italy and, and Spain and things like that. There is pushback, absolutely. So that in itself is in Europe. It's not certain whether that struggle will go in the right direction, but uh, I'm hoping, you know, because I think that they are still uh, seeing what's happening right now, kind of the increasing uh, hostility between China and the US will really you know, not only have very bad implications for for these two superpowers, but but also to the rest of the world, and that would include uh, Europe. So, um, and also Africa and uh, um, Asia. Mm. So, yeah. So the, the the notion of 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 shared identity, I think, is really important to make sure that we can continue to think along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important to keep that sort of front of mind because one of my greatest fears is coming out of this is actually we have a, a great rise in, uh, in particular in Australia, the call for sort of uh, nationalistic discourse kind of manifests in things like, well, actually we should be doing more, more at home. We should all our, we should move our manufacturing onto home soil. We should actually be less yeah. globalised. The reason we were vulnerable in the first place is because of this great globalisation. Yes, I mean that, that. That's I mean that, that, that's one of the other issues I have not really said much about, and you know, definitely the, the discourse of globalization is an important one, uh, especially in relation to this pandemic. Um, and there has been a lot of pushback against that, like you know, kind of we should stop kind of having kind of the global supply chains, and in, instead we have to have production in our own country and, and, and things like that. Uh, well, of course, a lot of economists actually say that 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 would be a, a disaster. But uh, at the same time, you know, of course, globalization also has been deeply uh, uh, implicated in in uh, creating this very unequal world. So, um, you know, that too is not a simple narrative, I think, pro or against globalization. That's not the issue. Mm. Uh, it, it is what kind of globalization. It's, it's you know, the, the, the need to continue to think in terms of interconnections at a global level remains as important as ever. Mm. 
Great. So we have a question that's um, on a very uh, a smaller scale crisis that affects the both of us or anyone who works in an institution. Um, and it's from Emily Zong. And she asks, can you say some words to ECRs who are facing the insecurity of the future academic job market in the current context of Australian universities cutting jobs and casuals? Yes, uh, I'm very aware of that. And uh, of course, I have uh, my own PhD students and, and younger colleagues uh, who are faced with this problem. And, and um, I, I, I can't, you know, I, I don't have a solution for that. Um, I think uh, it will be quite difficult uh, in the next, certainly the next five years, but maybe longer than that. Um, my understanding is that universities uh, will take at least two, three years to kind of get back on their feet to go to the way it used to be, but that we don't know what, what that is. The kind of thing uh, that perhaps is uh, important to keep in mind is uh, the kind of uh, fields that we are in, uh, in the humanities and social sciences. Um, it has been a very difficult uh, few decades for our kinds of disciplines where kind of the em emphasis has always been on STEM and uh, it's more important than ever, I think that we as HAS people, humanities, arts and social science people, uh, engage with the world in a way that uh, remains uh, accessible to people who are not in our fields. So uh, I think it's important that we do research, not just narrow, 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 kind of more specialized, but also open conversation uh, in partnership, perhaps with other organizations, uh, collaboration is important. So th that means that uh, as uh, new young scholars uh, nurture a sense of being in the world as, as a professional scholar uh, that is uh, very much uh, engaged with uh, the world we live in uh, and not just uh, kind of other students or other scholars, but uh, um, organizations, uh, communities, um, uh, people who uh, somehow uh, work in the arts or, you know, kind of the, so the sense of that we are here as a voice that, that works together to make sure that we develop uh, um, understandings of the world that are useful for people. I think that that's really important that we need to, to do. And if we can do that, then I think then universities will also have uh, a more uh, positive, hopefully, uh, 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 understanding of what has researchers can do. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, we have to continue to work uh, on uh, the word relevance is is you know, often mentioned in situations like this. So like, you know, that we, we develop uh, kind of uh, provide evidence that we are we can be relevant. Uh, certainly, I think in the, the current pandemic crisis, what we have seen a lot, of course, like, you know, well, we talk to medical scientists, we talk to epidemiologists, we talk about, uh, you know, scientists who develop vaccines. Now, what can, um, uh, sociologists do or cultural studies people do in the current crisis. I think we need to think about those kinds of things as well and then make clear to the broader society mm. that, uh, you know, we cannot have only STEM research. We need to have HAS research as well. Yeah. I mean, I wonder sort of to take a slightly more, uh, to go back into your talk and, and to look at one of the questions you posed around um, transition and post-capitalism, you know, is it possible to envision a post-capitalist university? Mm -hmm. um, 
you know well, Stumpless University <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, I mean because one of the crises is about funding right it's about it's true. Um, well, yeah I mean that the <laughs> I think that uh, Australia is very problematic in that sense. You know, it has actually, the governments have actually pushed and pushed on universities to become more entrepreneurial, to, to, to uh, you know, go after more and more international students. And now uh, universities are being pu punished for it. And I think it's, you know, really not kind of, um, uh, yeah, not, it's not fair, but I mean, that's the situation we are in, I think. Uh, I think in, in other countries, and again, in European countries, there is a more uh, kind of uh, uh, recognition of the importance of universities as public institutions. Uh, whereas here, kind of the emphasis has been very strongly on, on that neoliberal trajectory of, of, of uh, you know, you have to uh, go after your own funding and things like that. Mm. Uh, and that in itself is problematic, but I, I can't see, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, how that is going to change anytime soon in Australia, precisely because funding is so tight now. So uh, how do we change uh, Scott Morrison's mind about this? No idea. Yes, I mean, I think <laughs> we all wish we knew the answer. Again, actually, I do think uh, that... Uh, one way in which universities can address that is to actually show how they are really doing very useful work, you know, in their own communities, in their own regions. Uh, I think that that you know that universities are part of the economic recovery that uh, the government really wants so much, uh, and that the way we can contribute to that is important. Mm. Um, so we have another question from Fran Martin, mm -hmm. uh, who I think is sort of referencing back to a conversation we were having a little bit earlier. And she asks, um, you know, is the new question perhaps, is it possible to maintain cosmopolitanism on the ideological human level while reducing global free trade or transnational mobilities of finance and commodities? That is, um, can we challenge global neoliberal capitalism while at the same time maintaining and bolstering cosmopolitanism as a human value? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think to kind of prize open that whole range of concept, uh, you know, the uh, the global uh, globalization, the cosmopolitan, the the the, the transnational. Uh, I think uh, to somehow kind of think of those concepts, not throw them away, but to to to, to deal with them as, as a set of of ideas and 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 uh, kind of. Uh, things that we uh, uh, engage with in a way that combines with notions of uh, search for equality and solidarity and things like that is an important thing. So yeah, so I, I think it's really important to think about, uh, again, I'm, I'm repeating myself really, uh, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, globalization is not just one thing, it's, it's multiple things. In the past, uh, there was a, a kind of global trade, you know, even before neoliberalism, there was a global trade as well, you know. So, uh, and, and through trade, uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of different peoples have, have managed to kind of get interconnected. Uh, and, and through that, uh, multiple understandings of each other have, have developed. So uh, I think we have to continue to, to focus on that um, and not just uh, say we become our own nation with our walls around it and, and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and so much of that cosmopolitanism comes from um, consuming cultural goods from elsewhere. Right. Yes, exactly. You know, so in that sense, commerce is not a bad thing. You know, uh, it's it's necessary. So um, I think we need to, to think about that as well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so what? OK, so we have one final question, which is sort of uh, it's about a hopeful future. Um, and I suppose what makes you 
what makes you hopeful about the future? Um, what to end on to end on that optimistic, <laughs> the optimism of the will. Mm. Well, I feel um, I I don't have one one feeling about the future. I mean, it, it sometimes can be very pessimistic, and and you know that that collapse collapse uh, collapseology uh, is something that is uh, that has its attractions. You know, some people are very attracted to ideas of collapse because it gives them certainty. Yeah, so that this is going to happen, so we just have to prepare for it. Uh, I do think that uh, pessimism is um, here to stay. It, I don't think it's going, you know, we can't replace it with, with kind of uh, ideas of, of a utopian future or, or a kind of wonderful future because it's not going to be like that. I think we have to be sure about that. But I do think that we can still in uh, kind of like in the very concrete context that we operate, uh, the world is still much more complex than just that it goes in the direction of, of, of collapse, right? So there are still lots of issues uh, that we can engage with, whether it is uh, in our cities or with our students or in terms of engaging with refugees, for example, or, or uh, um, racism issues. Um, all those things are remain as important as ever, because I think that that's the way in which we make life uh, uh, kind of worth living. Uh, not so much just in the here and now, but like in the foreseeable future. So all those things that we have been doing uh, for years actually have perhaps become more urgent, like in terms of concrete politics. Um, and, and that's, I think, where the uh, hope can come from. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, so I think... I think we're going to leave it there now. So I'll just, um, before I thank you and sign off, I'll just uh, share details on our next seminar. So this is happening at the same time next week. Um, and the seminar is called Seeing Indigenous Land Struggles in COVID-19. And it's presented uh, by three people, one of which is Will Smith, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at Deakin University and one of my colleagues, um, Noah Thero, who's an assistant professor of anthropology at Carnegie Mellon University, and June Rubis, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sydney. Um, so please join us. Next week, same time, 10 a.m., um, details are there, uh, including uh, the event, right? So please do register if you'd like to receive the reminder about that seminar. And I'd like to thank you again, Ian, and to thank our audience for joining us on YouTube um, and to please have a great afternoon and thank you for sharing your insights today. Thank you. Okay, we're all done. Is that it?